Good morning. So I want to talk a bit about uh, future shock. That's what happens when the rate of technology change uh, runs headlong into the struggles of our social structures to adapt rapidly to that rate of technology change. So in that spirit, as Tim described, I want to talk really about three things. One are some of the opportunities that accrue from an emerging world of, of many devices and, and what that means for the future of computing experiences. Uh, some about the challenges that accrue from that and what it means for policy, uh, and then ultimately some potential solutions about how we might adapt technologically and, and policy-wise to be able to accommodate that world and deal with what fundamentally is our future shock, that the incredible rate of growth and demand for wireless spectrum is, is running, as I said, headlong directly into the ways that we've historically allocated spectrum. So how did we get where we are? If you think back about the history of the modern digital computer era over the past 50 or 60 years, it's really been one of increasing democratization. As we moved from a world of uh, mainframes and mini computers to workstations to PCs to smartphones, uh, and now to an emerging world of the Internet of Things, where uh, each of us uh, owns not just a handful of computers, but in fact, uh, unless we've been living in a cave, hundreds or thousands of computing devices that are embedded in everyday objects. Uh, and that brings some interesting opportunities to envision a new model of computing. And in some sense, our challenge and our opportunity is to escape from the old model, one that uh, dates back the better part of 40 years, uh, uh, the Windows and Icon and menu-based model, to one of much more natural computing where a plethora of devices anticipate and allow us to interact with them uh, in the same ways that we would interact with, with humans in daily life. Um, the key enablement of all of that, besides the kinds of things that are listed on this slide, uh, powerful but inexpensive uh, uh, system on a chip designs, the explosive growth of data and sensors, and, and you heard in the previous discussion some of the privacy and policy issues around that. But this notion uh, of everyday computing, not only for natural experiences, but what it means for the future of our critical infrastructure, for transportation systems, for communication systems, for smart grids, the future of hybrid and electric vehicles. All of those things become possible, but the enabler for many of them, besides the computing technologies and the sensors, is access to, to spectrum. Uh, and that sort of brings me to the challenge issue. Uh, all of these things are really about multimodal communication uh, across a wide variety of, of spectrum bands from what I might describe as a body area network, how do we communicate with sensors nearby to local area networks to wide area networks. And as we think about the growth and demand of spectrum, think about the following. Despite the massive build out that we've seen in wireless infrastructure, there are projections that the next coming wave the wave of, of wireless video could see in a, in a period of five years a growth in demand from perhaps 20x to as much as 40x in pressure on spectrum for wireless video. And yet most of our investment has, has rightly up to this point been in use of a small fraction of that spectrum. And as we look beyond the 3G to 4G and LTE, uh, our challenge really is how we think more nimbly about how we adapt to some of those possibilities. And if you think about the history, and this is an example of a spectrum allocation in the US, most of our policy approaches are derived from a time when the state of the art in radio technology was defined by vacuum tubes. It's not right, it's not wrong, it just is. Uh, and one of the consequences of that was because we had to design radios to operate in relatively narrow spectrum bands, we allocated the spectrum accordingly. Uh, and yet, there's an interesting paradox and conundrum at work. Although there's enormous pressure on a small fraction of the spectrum, uh, the part that we normally associate with cellular, in point of fact, if you turn on a spectrum analyzer most places in the world, most of the spectrum, most places, is relatively lightly used. And so there's an interesting conundrum there. There's an opportunity with cognitive radio, shifting what were historically hardware functions into software, to both attack the, the pressure on spectrum, but support this model of multimodal communication. And in some sense, what it does, to use a technical term, 
is it late, late binds the allocation of spectrum to runtime software decision making. So that when I turn on a device, it queries a database and it says, what spectrum can I use right here, right now? Am I a primary user? Am I a secondary user? If I'm a secondary user, then I have to get out of the way when a primary user appears. Uh, is it licensed and unlicensed? Yes. It's not a battle about licensed or unlicensed spectrum and the, the allocation of spectrum to each. It's a mechanism that will allow us with both technology and nimble policy to accommodate and use the existing spectrum across a wide range of bands much more efficiently. And so one of the issues that's been debated as a consequence of the, the transition to digital broadcast television was how we reap the digital dividend that comes with that. And one of the examples of that that's being considered by the FCC are the so-called white spaces, the ability to use some of the broadcast spectrum for secondary communication and unlicensed mode when it's not used for broadcast. I want to show you a brief video to try to illustrate some of those issues. But the takeaway I want you, you to capture is this is not just about white spaces. The whole notion of cognitive radio is much more applicable about how we manage spectrum broadly and much more nimbly. And it's not about licensed or unlicensed. It's about how we exploit it efficiently and that we do nimble adaptation. And so with that, let me show you this little one and a half minute video. With the ongoing transition from analog to digital TV, more and more spectrum is opening up. Adaptive radio technologies allow networks to have the advantages of inexpensive Wi-Fi and the long range of cellular. These technologies can help us use that spectrum by dynamically finding and using the white spaces between frequencies used by existing broadcasters and wireless microphones. This allows more users to coexist on the spectrum. Microsoft researchers have been exploring this challenge for many years and have created a network that finds and uses these white spaces. This technology uses your location and information from nearby transmitters to determine what frequencies are available, then dynamically moves to the frequencies for use in those white spaces. Technology like this can offer low-cost connectivity for underserved communities, schools, or hospitals. By ensuring that this spectrum is available for unlicensed use around the world, government policymakers can help innovators find even more uses for this bandwidth and preserve the economic and social value of this important resource. So as I said, this is not really about license or unlicensed, so this is one example of unlicensed use. It's really about nimble cognitive adaptation. How do we bring together a combination of flexible meta frameworks for, for spectrum use together with the ability to exploit uh, emerging software technologies that, that allow that adaptation? And so my takeaway message is really this. This future world of convergent communication across multiple spectral bands and how we enable next generation experiences, both consumer oriented, but also for broad device to device interaction, means we're gonna have to fundamentally rethink some of the ways that we've managed spectrum while respecting the investments of incumbents, the economics, the politics associated with that. This is a way to find some middle ground and accommodate both historical precedent but some of these emerging opportunities. It really is, though, about fundamentally how we address this issue of future shock. The inexorable and exponential growth and demand for spectrum among a wide variety of purposes and the historical approaches that are grounded in technologies from almost 100 years ago. And so with that context, uh, given that I only have a handful of minutes here in the last few seconds, uh, there's an expanded version of these remarks that have been posted on the Microsoft blog. I'd invite comments uh, and a mechanism to continue the discussion and interaction there. But I think we have an opportunity. We can make some amazing things happen, but to do so, we have to work together in some nimble and flexible ways, not only technologically, but as we think about policy. Thanks very much.